Hello and welcome everybody to this webinar on tips and strategies in using technology for mental health consultation. A very warm welcome you to, to all of you who've joined us for the live activity tonight. And I have to say that the number of registrations for this webinar is extraordinary. We're up to nearly four and a half thousand registrations. So that's incredible. And I think what it says is the level of interest among clinicians, particularly at the moment in this topic. So welcome to all of you. Welcome to those of you who are watching us later on a recording. And of course, a very warm welcome to our panel who I will introduce in just a moment. Before we start, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands across Australia, upon which our participants and our panelists are located. And I'd like to pay our respects to their elders, past, present, and future. Okay, um, let me just say a word about the background to this uh, particular webinar. Uh, the webinar is being uh, organized by MHPN, the Mental Health Professionals Network, but on behalf of the Victorian and Tasmanian Primary Health Network Alliance. And I think it came about really in recognition of the fact that there's a whole lot of clinicians out there who are being asked to use telecounseling in some form or another for the first time. And there was a feeling that there aren't many good guides around about it. And although there is some professional development activities, they tend to be very ex uh, expensive and often not accessible. So hopefully tonight we'll be able to discuss most of the key issues raised in this area. And I'm sure that by the end, you'll find that it's been useful. My name is Mark, Mark Creamer. I'm a clinical psychologist in private practice and also a professor in department psychiatry at the University of Melbourne. And as a clinician, even though my private practice at the moment is fairly small, like everybody else, I've been forced to rethink the way that I do my therapy in these strange and peculiar times that we find ourselves in. And so I've been uh, using telephone and some video conferencing to do my therapy. And I must say that I found a number of challenges with it. So it's a great honor tonight to be able to facilitate this panel and to pick the brains of our esteemed panelists. So without further ado, let me introduce them. You've got their biography, so I'll keep it very, very brief. Our first panelist tonight is Monica Moore. Monica is a GP with over 20 years experience in family practice. She now specializes in psychological medicine. She's the coordinator of the Sutherland MHPN group and she's also uh, an educator training uh, medical uh, students and GPs in mental health issues. So, Mo uh, Monica, welcome and thank you very much for joining us. That's right, Just take it off mute. mute. Myself. Yes, yeah. I'll get off mute, yes. Yeah. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for inviting me, Mark. It's, it's a very honor and a pleasure to be here. Well, thank you. It's a great pleasure to have you. Um, now, I thought that we might ask everybody uh, just a little bit about their personal experience of social isolation. So I wonder if you could kick us off, uh, Monica. What do you think has been the best and the worst aspect for you from a personal perspective about social isolation? Look, I'll, I'll start with the worst first. Um, I think for me it's the fact that I haven't been able to hug my granddaughter who was born in February. And that's been quite difficult for me. Um, and, and my children, essentially, so, yep. and, and missing out on friends. The lovely thing, though, is the ability to work from home. I never realised I'd enjoy it so much. And the kindness of strangers. Mm, very nice. The kindness of strangers. I like that. If we'd had time, I would get you to expand on that, but I'm afraid we don't. But thank you very much anyway, Monica. Um, our next panellist is David Zuereb. David is a psychologist in Melbourne's western suburbs. He's got a fascinating career background that spans education, housing, occupational rehab, and disability services. But for the last four years or more, he's been specializing in providing cognitive behavior therapy to clients in rural and remote areas. Welcome, David. Thanks very much for joining us. I'm oh, glad to be here. I'm very honored to uh, be uh, with uh, the panel tonight. Very Thank fun. you. Thank you. And let me ask you the same question then, David, just very briefly. From a personal perspective, what have you found good and what have you found not so good about social isolation? Well, you, you only um, you know, value uh, the, the uh, collegiate support working amongst colleagues when it's not there. So I'm, uh, I see that as a bit of a drawback. Mm. Um, and and uh, perhaps the, the a positive would be 
um, being able to uh, is just being able to do uh, your whole day from the one spot rather than having to travel to and from, say, the home office to to, to the work site. Saves a lot of time on commuting, doesn't it? Yeah, but yeah, I, I quite agree that. The, the nature of the beast, I suppose, is social isolation, and that we really have to make an effort not to become professionally isolated, don't we? Anyway, thank you very much, David. Our final Hello. panelist tonight is Tessa Moriarty. Tessa is a mental health nurse, nurse consultant with many years of experience in both public and private sector mental health services. She's an experienced group and individual psychotherapist and has recently started to specialize in providing supervision and therapy via telephone and teleconferencing. Uh, welcome, Tessa. Thanks for joining us tonight. Thank you very much, Mark. It's great to be here. So finally, uh, your views. What do you think have been the best and the worst of social isolation for you? Um, look, the best things have actually been having to learn and do new things. Um, well, that's been awesome. I've been used to working from home, so that's uh, not being new, but um, it has been lovely. And I guess the worst thing, like yourself, Monica, has been missing not having that contact with my grandson and, of course, my um, sons and my extended family and friends. And it's something, I guess, that um, as clinicians we need to be very aware of in our clients as well, that they too are missing out on that close uh, personal contact. Anyway, thank you, Tessa, and thank you very much to all our panel. It's obvious, isn't it, that they have a huge amount to offer us tonight, so I'm looking forward to getting into it. Before we do, can I just tell you quickly about the platform that you're looking at? Uh, it's very straightforward. I'm sure many of you have used it before. There is a purple button which allows you to open the chat box and post comments uh, uh, or opinions uh, during the course of the webinar. There's a blue button which allows you to access resources, including slides and panel bios and so on. I would ask you to uh, withhold your enthusiasm at this point. Uh, MHPM will send you a link to access all the resources in a week or so, and then you can go through them in, 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 uh, uh, with all the time in the world. And then the yellow button is to do the feedback survey, which we really, really want you to do, but of course you can't do that until the end. So just reserve that until we get to the end of the webinar. Okay, so tonight we're looking at tips and challenges for providing telephone uh, tele -counseling. And I should note that we're gonna try not to use the word telehealth. The reason for that is telehealth is the word used to describe the specific Medicare item. So uh, we'll try not to use it, but if we do slip into it, and I know I will, um, Please remember that we're talking about telehealth broadly and not uh, the specific Medicare item. So tonight I'm going to ask each of the panelists in turn to give us a brief presentation about their unique perspectives on the challenges and uh, the tips uh, of telecounseling. And uh, I, I've told them that they can only have five minutes, so if they're looking a bit rushed, it's entirely my fault. Uh, but then we'll go off into a broader discussion uh, where we can delve down deeper into the issues raised and that discussion will be driven in large part by the questions that you, our participants, have sent in. And we hope that following the uh, webinar tonight, uh, you will have, first of all, an improved awareness about the opportunities, challenges, and risks in conducting mental health consultations by telephone and or video conferencing. That you'll also have some practical tips and strategies to use that are going to improve outcomes not only for your clients, but we hope also for you. And as a result of that greater awareness and those tips and strategies, that you're going to feel more confident doing telecounseling with your, with your clients from now on. Okay, so I think at this point, uh, I will, uh, without further ado, hand over to our first panelist, Monica Moore, to provide her particular perspective on telecounseling. Over to you, Monica. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Um, I'm, I'm just, just going to put up my first slide. Okay, so that slide just represents how I had to jump in on the 16th of March, feet first, what I thought was the deep end, but in fact I think has proven to be much less challenging than I would imagined. Um, and so in terms of what I was um, looking at and the opportunities and the benefits that I've uh, concentrated on 
since I started, okay, working from home and I'm using Zoom, okay, that's what I've decided to use, is that some patients actually prefer it. Um, they, they've said that, you know, it's really lovely not having to commute. I've got some who travel for over an hour. Um, it also means that, and this is I've heard from colleagues, okay, who have patients in the residential aged care facilities, that it has improved access for these people to even see specialists, psychiatrists, um, and to get their, their um, you know, anyone with poor mobility, it's a boon to have um, the telecounselling. It's a really efficient way for GPs to work because it means that only the people who really need to come in and be seen in the surgery need to be seen. And so it actually saves not only the time for the patient, but also for the GP. And of course, you know, as a GP, can I just say, it's lovely to be remunerated for phone calls um, and, you know, for scripts for um, antidepressants or whatever it is that the patient is taking. And, you know, and, the, and one of the things my friend who's a country GP said is that, isn't it lovely not to have to give them the appointment, which is in three weeks time because it's non-urgent and they can actually get like their results, their blood test results or their script that day because it just takes a phone call. Um, I think it's also good for the environment because there's less pollution with all this, you know, less traffic and less accidents. Uh, I, was, I don't know about you, but I was watching that sort of thing about, you know, Venice with no tourists and the water so clear, the air so clear. Uh, and, and as I said, I've really been enjoying um, working from home. So unfortunately, you know, the things that really frightened me at the start were what if someone has a reaction? What if they have an ab reaction? They're really distressed, they can't do anything. What if the, the platform fails? And so, um, you know, there are some patients where it's actually been a little bit difficult, where they've said that the lack of physical, of human contact has been a challenge. And also um, that sort of thing about Zoom fatigue, you know, what um, Gian Piero Petrigleria was talking about when he said it's that, um, you know, that, that the constant presence of each other's absence because there's missing information in terms of the body language. And of course, we have to use a platform that is encrypted so that it's safe. I think in terms of my practical tips, and I think, you know, it'd be lovely to talk about this later, okay, is that I do send an email to patients before the session with a consent form with lots of information and also with some practical tips for the session that I've developed over time with some other information. And that's up on my website if you want to have a look. Um, I also keep my phone handy because if you do have um, poor connection with Zoom, you can always keep the video going and even though it's patchy, it's okay. But you've got a really good phone connection, the sound is coming through, it makes it so much easier. And I get to contact people details in case there's a crisis. Um, and I think, you know, in terms of, we can talk a little bit more later about the technical things about where you put the camera and the light and all that kind of thing. But, um, but I think I, I just looked up YouTube clips uh, and, uh, and got some advice about how to do it so that patients will feel more comfortable. I will feel more comfortable. I really like my heated blanket in these cold mornings. And I use a lot of apps and websites to patients, giving them to patients so that they can practice for themselves. One of the things about Zoom is that you can share your screen. So I can show them videos, I can show them slides from with their information. And so I think it's a really useful um, platform for me to use. I bought the, um, the private version so that you, uh, it's more encrypted. And so that's what I use. So those were the sorts of things that I had to say. So yeah. You finished a bit more suddenly than I expected you to, there, Monica. But oh, thank you sorry. very much indeed. I was trying to keep the time. <laughs> no, you have done brilliant. You've come in comfortably under time. I hope everybody else is watching. I hope they're all going to learn from you. Um, but thank you very much. That was really interesting. I, I loved your first slide there, and you talk about jumping in with both feet. Um, I guess my question would be, what have you done, or, or how have you tried to make it easier for yourself to manage? telecounseling and, and working from home? I think one of the things that I did that made it easier was that I was doing it together with my two work colleagues. And so we were going through the same stresses together. And we would talk on the phone and FaceTime during lunchtime. And, um, you know, there were issues with billing. Um, and so we had to find a platform that would, you know, help with the billing. And I'm a GP. And, and so I had to work out how to do it with you know, Medicare Online, 
um, it was a very stressful time and uh, and so but we were supporting each other so that was one thing the second thing is is that I tried to make my room comfortable so I, I've got a corner of the study um, if I were to move my camera you would see that there's a whole mess on the other side it's the other side of the study it's very messy but this side of the study is sort of I try and make it a calm presence uh, so I was trying to, to sort of make it comfortable for other people uh, and so I would be less stressed and I always was asking patients you know what could we do to make this easier because it's stressful for everyone and I have half an hour gap between patients so that I don't get too exhausted that's the sort of things I can think of yeah great all good tips there thank you very much indeed Monica yeah and um, I like your first po point there about actually having the capacity to get support from your colleagues I think is so important and highlights the comment David made earlier about We've just got to be so careful not to get too isolated. But anyway, that's wonderful. Thank you, Monica. Um, let's move on now to get a rural health and CBT perspective. Uh, David, if I could uh, hand over to you for your presentation. Yeah, thank you, Mark. Uh, so, as Mark suggested, my, uh, the emphasis on my experience uh, going back to about 2016 was to the uh, provision of uh, uh, telecounseling CBT in um, uh, rural areas of New South, New South Wales. And the, in that time, that there were uh, some themes that seemed to be um, cropping up that uh, seemed to um, apply to particularly um, individuals that were quite socially isolated. So um, the, the uh, things that uh, that struck me were included. Um, some clients uh, do have uh, quite, um, do they struggle with uh, access to services? Uh, if they're lucky, they may, for example, be able to um, see their psychiatrist uh, um, through uh, a, a, a video conferencing. Personally, uh, most of my work um, um, sorry, with the uh, psychiatrist video conferencing, that would, be, would have been, my understanding was uh, carried out at, at the GP's uh, uh, clinic. But uh, so, uh, so you, you could see there were shortages of uh, particular types of health services in, in some of these areas. And um, the, for, for myself, I basically uh, maintained the use of uh, telephone for counselling. Uh, I suppose uh, uh, at the time, pre-pandemic era, uh, video wasn't um, uh, something uh, that I was uh, asked to provide my clients, and every, I, if not a single client objected to um, having their um, sessions um, run by telephone. In fact, um, it, it, it did quite. It, it worked quite effectively, I thought. So that's the problem. But the point being is that um, being isolated may, you know, would mean that sometimes you have to go the extra mile to um, connect them up to services. Um, uh, for perhaps uh, the one go-to place I'm sure is used widely already out there would be the uh, website infoexchange.org.au which uh, provides a, a very nice, neat um, uh, database of services across Australia uh, um, out there in the community, so it, it making uh, it much, much easier to link up um, it, it clients with um, services within the community. And then, of course, the same would go to, to be um, linking them with services provided by, say, local council. Um, also, some clients, um, experience um, loneliness or social isolation. You know, this is pre-pandemic um, area, um, social isolation. They just go days and days without really talking to anyone. And uh, I, I, I'm pretty sure this, this is a, it would be the explanation why they have so much pent up um, things to say. And you'll read, you know, over the um, session, after two weeks of perhaps not speaking to a soul, it all comes out in a flood, in a bit of a monologue. And the, 
and knowing this is uh, pretty handy because uh, being prepared and being able to try and steer them back to to the um, to, to the uh, therapeutic uh, agenda or purpose um, can be a little tricky at times. Um, and then there are clients who lack informal support through friends and family, and um, it seemed to me that over that period there was a pattern of people um, uh, really struggling to navigate um, problems through relationships. And you know, it made me wonder that had they been less socially isolated, that, um, that this wouldn't have been uh, as much of a difficulty. Now, for some tips, I suppose, but this is again particularly applied to uh, uh, telephone work. Um, that there's the the. So, sorry, David, to interrupt. I'm, I'm just going to have to ask you to move along a bit quickly. Perhaps yep. just another minute or so. Sure thing. So um, basically. Um, it, being able to um, uh, say uh, yes, you know, uh, uh, an acknowledgement or a heart during uh, the session helps the, cl the client on the other end um, feel secure that, you know, they are being listened to because they can't see what's going on on the other end, obviously. Um, now, um, because uh, if, if it's done through a telephone, you, you, there's a lot of visual cues missed. So, Perhaps more regular uh, reassessments of the, the, the client's progress using K10s and re uh, revisiting of therapeutic goals on a more regular basis, I found to be uh, quite helpful to dispel any doubts about how things were going. Um, also, uh, the expectation of what can be achieved in, in, in telecounseling. I think um, you know, one of was saying that. You know, it's, it's, it's uh, going into the deep end. But one of those uh, things is that perhaps going in with different expectations of what can be achieved um, using the the, um, the, the, the format, uh, uh, simply because uh, logistical things like um, bandwidth and, and time delays and everything else that comes with this uh, new way of working. Um, and, and you know, asking, um, especially again over uh, the telephone, you know. Through uh, the session, so how does that? Uh, is this making sense to you? And how do you feel about proceeding with this? Just to get um, that co little confirmation um, that uh, you, you may miss um, by telephone that you would ordinarily get by video. And um, the one, one important thing I do want to just uh, drop in is that there, there seems anecdotally, uh, uh, at least so given uh, by the experiences of other, other counsellors and. and uh, experience by myself that over the telephone people tend to be a, a little less inhibited in being able to disclose um, sensitive personal information and so that is one at least one um, uh, uh, plus one, one uh, advantage of uh, running uh, uh, sessions by telephone. Okay so how am I doing with time Mark? Uh, we've run out so I, I think in, oh, sorry, if okay. it's okay we <laughs> might yeah we might leave sure. it there but thank you very much for that and of course, we oh, will delve into a lot of that stuff in more detail as we go into a discussion. Um, but because time is tight tonight, I'm going to move straight on uh, and introduce our final panelist to get uh, Tessa to tell us her perspective on telecounseling. Over to you, Tessa. Ah, just about forgot to um, take myself off mute. There you go. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mark. So um, I'm going to whiz through my slides to my end slide, which um, I talk more to um, the issue, um, and I bring up some strategies and tips. So I think the you know a couple of the biggest opportunities for me have been that it is as uh, Monica said, it's time efficient and cost effective. So it doesn't rely on myself or the people I work with meeting at a joint location, and that I can actually work with people. Um, actually from all over the country. So I think it's a very accessible, but not location-based services. The challenges, of course, have been um, are mostly platform availability and connection issues. I live in um, the tip of Mornington Peninsula, and for some reason, sometimes my connection is quite poor, even on the telephone. Um, the other challenge has actually been that um, uh, particularly if it's something as simple as telephone um, telephone counselling, as um, David just said, is the fear, um, even with professionals, that somehow it's actually not better. 
it's not as good as face to face. Um, and I'm going to talk more about that in a minute. Um, some of the risks uh, have the, the same as the challenges is that uh, the connection issues, you know, uh, not only might I have problems with my connection, but um, as often does happen, it invariably happens, um, the people I work with will invariably have connection issues. And the other risk, though, it hasn't been a huge issue, and I think, it, again, it depends. Um, the group of people that you're working with is managing a crisis. Um, so <clears throat> I'll talk more about that shortly. And the other thing is the boundary issues. Um, you know, with the COVID, it brought so many people home, kept people at home to work. And um, so I think there's a number of issues around home becomes work, your workplace. Um, and it's tempting to think you're actually at home, which you are, but you actually got to work. So, um, and the other boundary issue is that sometimes there's challenges around um, both some of the people I work with, but also notice that within myself wanting to know more um, about me. Right, so I've, I've kind of put my, the issues and the strategies into a table and going back to what I started with, um, the platform availability and connection issues. You know, for me, the biggest lessons have been around being planned, you know, being organised, um, being prepared in advance, making sure that, um, uh, the people I work with know in advance what to do if things go wrong and having a backup plan. It's as simple as you know, having the phone ready and charged <laughs> in case the video platform actually doesn't work. And, um, and you know, sometimes actually even starting with the mobile. Um, the perception and fear that somehow face-to-face -face is not as good um, you know, I have actually been working on, with the telephone uh, a lot longer than I have on the video platform. But um, I offer the, the fact that it might be a trial. So when, when people, whether they've been clients or professionals, are a little hesitant to use the telephone or the video, I say, well, let's give it a trial. Um, my experience has been many people are a little reluctant at first. Um, they're anxious about it. And, you know, I haven't worked with anyone that hasn't got used to it in the end. Um, but let's give it a go. And if it doesn't work for you, it doesn't work for you. So giving people an out as well. Um, managing a crisis, you know, be it a connection crisis or a mental health crisis. For me, in so many ways, it's, it's very similar. It's the same as I would do. Um, if I was there, even though I'm actually not there, um, and working with whatever I've got. But, you know, simple little things like making sure I've got enough information uh, about a person, their address, other contact details, you know, and having advanced safety plans. Um, but also, uh, when the crisis is finished, making sure that both myself and or whoever I'm working with are debriefed. Um, and I can't overemphasize the importance of supervision. Um, and I might say more about that in a minute. Boundary issues. Um, so, you know, I, I do, the majority of my work actually is with professionals. I do some telephone counseling and EAP, but most of my work is actually um, working with people who work at the front line. Um, uh, you know, so boundary issues, working from home and taking care of self are really, really important to me. Um, and I've noticed since COVID-9 how, how much more important it is, partly because so many more people are working at home. A couple of things I want to say is that um, it's really important to be human. My own theoretical approach to working with people uh, in whatever context and whoever they are is that we're all human beings, um, and I'm a human, um, but, uh, but it's also really important to be professional. So, you know, some amount of um, self-disclosure, for instance, it can be useful. It can help engage um, someone I'm working with, and it can actually help them explore their issues. But, of course, it's the same as if I was in the office working with them. It's not for my purposes. It's 
for the other's purpose. Just one um, more minute, Tessa. Okay, no. So the, the last one is working well from home. Again, it's about being organised, being ready, being prepared, being tidy. Um, and the last thing I'd say um, about working well from home is separating my workspace from my home space. You know, if possible, make sure you've got an office to work from. If you haven't, have a dedicated desk, but it's about a dedicated space, dedicated and protected time to actually do your work well and do it properly. Um, that's actually it. Mark. Lovely. <laughs> thank you very much indeed, Tessa. And indeed, thank you very much to all of our participants. I think given that the time is moving on, we should go straight into the general discussion. Uh, but a whole lot of points that were raised there, I think you'll agree, in, the, in those three presentations that are worth delving into in a little bit more detail. So let's kick off the broader discussion. I'm going to invite uh, all the panel members to jump in and add things whenever they want. We'll try and make it as interactive as possible. Um, to, did, they can disagree with each other even. They can add alternative perspectives, whatever. And I would like to say at the outset that I've been extremely impressed by the number and quality of questions that we've received from you, the participants. And I would love to go through each of them in turn and answer them one by one, but we don't have time to do that. Hopefully, we've managed to incorporate them all into um, the themes that we're going to address now. But if we don't get around to your particular question, please uh, bear with us. OK, so let's go on then to um, uh, open the general discussion. And I'd like to start, if I could, with something about um, practical tips. Let's get them out of the way, because a lot of people did ask about practical tips. And several of you have mentioned a few, but I might come right back to you, Monica, if I could, and ask if there are any other practical tips that you'd like to offer, and then I'll ask the others to jump in. One of the interesting ones that someone said was, how close or far do you sit from the screen? Do you do it close up, like you're, you're on? Or is it like in therapy, where you're sitting well back and the client can see the whole of you? Do you have any advice on that one? Yeah, I was thinking about this, um, Mark, and uh, and you know, it, it seems to me that um, because we're missing so much of the body language um, by not being in each other's presence, um, then the least I can do is to be as close to the screen as. But but I try and sort of do it so that they can see like a bit of me, like it's not just my face, because I think that that would be too hard. Um, and that's again, I was just looking up on YouTube. Um, and I try and have a light so that it shows my face. People can see my eyes and my facial expressions. And I, I do try and encourage them to do the same, especially when I'm doing EMDR. I want to be able to see their eyes. Um, in terms of practical tips, the other thing is about wearing work clothes. I know it doesn't seem to make sense. It doesn't matter what you've got underneath where they can't see you. Um, you can have our boots if you like. But when you put your work clothes on, you not only do you feel professional, but you get that professional air as well. And I think that's important. Um, and Absolutely. Uh, and in fact, perhaps yeah. important also for boundaries. We're going to come back right yeah. at the end and talk about boundaries, but I, but I think that's a yeah. good example, putting your work clothes on. Other, uh, yeah, go on. No, no, you go on. It's all right. Yeah. The, the only other thing I was going to say is making sure that you've always got like things that you would normally have in your office. Okay. So in other words, water and pen and paper and tissues and even, and you are suggesting that to them as well. I send an email to people. Um, so that they can be prepared on their end as well. Um, and uh, I, I live on, you know, there's, there's only two of us, we don't have children, so I'm not dealing with all the issues that other people have of trying to create a workspace like Tessa did. So, yeah, there's so many mm. others, but I'll stop now. Absolutely, but um, I do like that idea of making sure that you've got a good um, email or information sheet to send to people. And I know that you've very yeah. kindly shared yours. So. Uh, as Monica said in her talk, they're on her website, and the link to the website will be in the resources when you get around to having a look at it when MHPN send you a link to that. So there's some really good stuff there, and including that kind of email I think is important. Can I just check in, because I want to move on to something else, but check in with uh, David and Tessa whether there's anything you'd add there about the very practical things of setting up the session. Anything either of you would like to add there? Um, yeah, I'll, I'll look, I'll just add, there's this whole issue about do you look at the person's face and, or do you look at the camera, you know, and um, when you're working with a group, and it, it can be quite hard not to look at someone's face if you've got, you know, four or more people on your actually monitor screen. Um, I think it's, it is important to sit square, you know, sit 
um, so that people can see you. And you have a little image of yourself um, in the, on the monitor on the screen. So I think I try to use that as a gauge as well. Um, I think it is important to sit not too close so that if I, if I want to kind of come in a little bit, I can. So that's, that's that little thing I would add. And I'd also agree with you, Monica. So important to have water, <laughs> you know, pen, extra things, have everything ready on my desk so I don't have to get up and go. Mm. Yeah, good advice. Good advice indeed. And uh, I think the thing about looking at the camera is an important one because it's easy to look off to the side, isn't it? Because I try desperately to look at the camera, which I'm doing now, but I can't help look at the screen to my left, which is where I'm seeing the pictures of what's going up and the other panellists. Um, David, I'm going to ask a specific question to you, but did you want to add anything on those particular points at this, at this time? Yeah, in terms of setting up the, uh, the session, I found that uh, people appreciate uh, um, emailed head-ups and material coming in through maybe hours or perhaps uh, the day before, or maybe um, all sent out um, at the session. Um, so if people just um, have sometimes have uh, difficulty being able to you know, um, access a printer and um, it may mean, you know, I mean, I had someone who had to go into work, well, you know, do some printing, but maybe they need to, you know, office work, they may not be um, as well resourced as we would assume them to be. So just checking in with, uh, with, with some to, that they, they are able to uh, make use of and have access to a particular when you're sitting the, the, the uh, and strip of I think it's a, that's very good advice, isn't it? And I think it um, uh, depends on the way you work. And I, I'm not sure whether Monica or Tessa would even agree with me. But for me, even if it's a face-to-face -face session, at the end of the session, I'm thinking, what am I going to do with this person next time? And that does give me the opportunity to send them any handouts, for example, that we're going to use in the next telecounseling session, to send them and, and set an agenda and say, this is what I thought we'd talk about next time. David, can I come back to you, please? Um, I just want to very quickly and, and not going into details, but do we need to worry about security issues? And I'm thinking both in terms of the platform that we're using, but also in terms of materials that we might be sending either online or, or via email. Um, is security an issue that you think we should be aware of? So, so Monica mentioned um, the uh, fever service uh, um, uh, Zoom. So, uh, I, I don't use it personally, so it's a step up the premium product and she mentioned encryption. Um, but my understanding is that um, Zoom doesn't have intent encryption unless they've rectified that in, in recent weeks. I, the, Zoom, I would... the Zoom, which is free, doesn't have encryption. Yeah, but if you pay yeah. for the subscription, it is encrypted mm. and you can make it more secure. So, yeah, so that, that's something to be aware of. Um, what's happened, and um, I I um, would um, point people to um, listen in to the uh, Radio National ABC uh, background briefing dated 19th of April, and about 22 minutes into this, you can get it as a podcast, um, the, the, it was a very incisive um, uh, 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 bit of journalism where they looked into the problems with um, a, a thousand um, downloaded Zoom meetings some of which were actually you know, sensitive counselling sessions for up on the internet for everyone to see. Now, this was done, of course, without the consent of the people involved in those yeah. sessions. So clearly, we, we, do need to, we, we do need to be very aware, obviously, that the platform that we're using is secure. I, I, I take that point entirely. Um, can I just perhaps move on, um, Tessa, and bring you in here? One of the issues that we're concerned about, I guess, is privacy not only in terms of, of that kind of stuff I was talking about with David, but also just in terms of the, you know, if, if, if you're seeing the client in their own house, there's loads of potential for other people to be overhearing and so on. Is that something that we should be addressing with people? Absolutely, most definitely. Um, and because we can only see what's in front of our eyes on the monitor, I think it's important to talk about that um, beforehand. So it, it's part of the, the planning so explaining the importance of privacy, um, for, you know, for them, but also explaining where I'm working from to ensure that privacy and that confidentiality. Having protected time, like I said before, a room, a space, 
where you're not interrupted, where there isn't, you can't hear the dog barking out the back, where the kids don't come running into the room, um, you know, so that you've spoken with someone else in the house, an adult, who will look after the kids. I think those things are much more important, again, for, say, a counselling session um, than they might be for a work meeting. It's still important, but, you know, again, context does make a difference. Mm, sure. And um, we might, if we get time, just talk briefly about children later, but it does strike me that that's potentially a particular problem with children, giving, you know, if we're doing a session with them about being able to ensure that they have privacy from parents or whatever. Um, Okay, so privacy is very important. Can I move on slightly and talk a little bit about engaging people, how we might engage people in this thing, in telecounseling? And I suppose that one of the things is the perception perhaps that, and I think uh, Tessa alluded to this, that telecounseling is not as good as face-to-face. -face. I wonder if I could ask you, David, whether you would agree with that or whether you think maybe that, um, well, that it is as good and perhaps in some cases it might even be better. What, what, would, you, what would you say to those concerns? Now, I, in terms of better, I, I did in, in the presentation mention that point about um, people over the telephone perhaps being um, this, uh, inhibited um, in, in, in disclosing personal information. That was one, one thing that came up with telephone calls. But um, so, so are we also talking about tips, Mark, for how to um, uh, build, say, therapeutic alliance? Well, yeah, that's, well, that was going to be my next question. So since you've got the floor, why don't you go oh, on with that? Yeah, th no, that's good. You, you keep going. So, yeah, tips to build the therapeutic alliance. How do we engage someone? And part of it, I guess, is being able to convince them that this, this mode of delivering treatment is effective and it's, it's going to be okay for you and so on and reassuring them. But, but tell me more about what you think, David, about how we might engage people. Well, uh, probably it, it comes down to a matter of emphasis in, in things that we probably do uh, normally. But... Um, particularly over the telephone, but even with um, uh, video um, telecounselling, perhaps uh, uh, a, a bit more emphasis than usual on um, psychoeducation, socialisation to treatment, and you know maybe um, some informal conversation in the early uh, phases of uh, counselling as an icebreaker. Um, so, whereas you know in the face-to-face -face setting. Everyone's present there. Um, there's that um, understanding that I'm, you know, that the counsellor is listening intently. It's there, um, uh, you know, for, for the, uh, the client to, to, to be aware of. But once you get into the realm of um, tele counselling, uh, particularly the telephone, the client, you know, it, it starts to. Uh, uh, Perhaps uh, you know feel that um, uh, they, they may feel that uh, something may be missing in this process, and, um, but you, you're taking them back to a place where you're reassuring that, that there is a process behind uh, counselling. You know everything from uh, uh, evidence-based um, strategies through through to sort of the areas that I mentioned before. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and I guess, you know, we're, we're talking in many ways, and I would actually feel this about the whole area, um, that it, much of it is similar to face-to-face, -face, you know, and if you're going to do it in face-to-face, -face, and we're talking, uh, Tessa was talking about, you know, looking at the camera and so on, looking at the person, making them feel as though you're listening to them, as you say, David, is, is so important. Monica, can I bring you in here as well, and really just to, to um, see whether you've got anything further to add to this. Obviously, some people are uncomfortable with technology. They're a bit anxious about doing it, and they don't have the benefits, perhaps, of coming to see you. Do you have any strategies to, to help people feel more comfortable to engage them? I guess I've, I've had most of the people that I've been working with, um, uh, and I've been using uh, the Zoom platform exclusively. I did try some fun counselling initially. Um, most of them were people that I already knew. Um, but I've had several new referrals um, and uh, and done them all on Zoom and found that if we both acknowledge that this is disaster counselling, we're doing this for a reason to flatten the curve, to keep it, you know, it, it, it's can we just accept that perhaps we're just going to try it out and see how it goes? And I think because 
I've been able to ask them, you know, what are your concerns? Um, I've been able to address the Zoom concerns, um, uh, you know, which is also on my consent form. Um, and I do send them a consent form with lots of information as well as the email before the session. Just by talking about the difficulties and talking about the fact that um, it's new for me and new for them and that um, the idea is to voice things early and to sort things out. And I think that that's really how you build engagement anyway with people in your room. There's always misunderstandings in the first session. Exactly. Exactly yeah. right. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Could I, could um, I just add something to, to please that do, Tessa. Yeah. Of engagement. So um, one of the things that I notice working, particularly telephone, is that I listen differently. You know, um, I listen and I hear things that I wouldn't see, opposite of I can't see. So I'm, you know, I'm not just hearing the content or the emotion or the feeling, but I'm hearing things that aren't there even. So, you know, I'm noticing what they're not saying in as much as I'm noticing what they are saying. But I also hear more about tone, volume, inflection, you know, and I will ask more questions. I think you alluded to this before, David. If I think someone is distressed and I can't tell by listening, I'll actually ask them. And are you crying? Are you actually really distressed? You know, I can't see you, but it sounds like you might be. So I think those little things are really, really important. And I think that's one of the beautiful things about telephone counselling is I've learned to listen, you know, I think much better. It's an interesting point, isn't it? I can't help thinking about people who lose a sense, who, who, who go blind or deaf or whatever, and they talk about how much more acute their other senses become. And Yeah, very, very interesting point, Tessa. Um, I just want to go back a little bit. Uh, this is a question I was going to ask David, but we were running out of time. So, But you've mentioned it, Monica, so let me bring it up. Um, and that is about, you know, do we see this as something that's only while we're in this pandemic crisis? Or, David, I'll go to you. Do you think this is something that, that has much more of a future that we should be becoming more comfortable with, even when we can go back to straightforward face-to-face -face stuff? Well, um, the, the first thought that comes to mind is that there may be um, everyday um, type of tasks that can be replaced by, say, videos, um, uh, tele um, work, but not necessarily counselling. So, for example, if, if you had down, say, three or four clients that uh, you thought needed a bit of a follow-up from the previous session or just checking in with them. Well, I mean, you know, in the past I would have done that by phone, but I've re-evaluated that and I think um, uh, given that Zoom, or, you know, video um, uh, work is now seem is seemingly just part of the landscape, I would, um, you know, wouldn't blink and, and just uh, set up a, a Zoom call to have that type of face-to-face -face, uh, or, uh, well, you know, um, video um, catch up because uh, even though it might be just an informal or, or um, just a very short catch up, it just uh, adds, it, it can just add to the information that you're seeking. Sure, absolutely, absolutely. So it has got, it has got potential going forward, hasn't it? Um, and, 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 sorry, sorry, but could I just drop in too that, um, that um, this whole idea about working through video. Uh, and um, whether or not it can be funded, you know, through, say, you know, the likes of Medicare. And it, I, I would have thought that after uh, the era pandemic, that we, we could have more multidisciplinary um, uh, type meetings out in the community, you know, breaking down these silos. Uh, this is the thing that seems to be coming up in, in uh, mental health reviews uh, often. And it may be that um, we feel um, throughout the um, uh, health and medical communities that um, video conferencing is was something that was always there but never used in terms of those sort of multidisciplinary meetings. Sure, absolutely, absolutely. But as you as you said or implied there, you know, really whether or not Medicare choose to continue to rebate it will be a big uh, factor in whether or not it continues, I guess. Uh, or at least uh, at what level. Let's move on now. I'd like to move on and look at some of the more clinical issues. And one of the issues that a lot of participants were concerned about, and I'm not surprised, although I would say I think it's equally true of face-to-face, -face, but what happens when they're, you're worried about the person? What, 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 when, what, what happens when there's some risk? If I could turn to you, Tessa, first and, and ask, um, do you think it's possible to do a good risk assessment through telecounseling, through these platforms? 
Absolutely, I do. Um, you know, I've been using and supervising um, telephone in, intake and risk assessments and services for a long time. And um, so uh, it's highly possible. I think you've got to have a, a, you've got to have a really good evidence-based tool, a really good framework um, to do risk assessments from. Um, and in many ways, they are a shortened version of your face-to-face -face risk assessment. But um, again, it's, it's, it's similar principles. You know, you've got to ask all the same sorts of questions that you would ask if the person is actually with you. So, I know that half the audience out there are thinking, what risk assessment tool does she use? <laughs> is it something, is it uh, something that right. you can share? Or? Well, most well, definitely. There are lots around. So the, uh, a particularly good telephone risk assessment tool, actually, is the one that um, the New South Wales um, Health Department use, and they, they have a whole policy, procedures, and tools for telephone, um, telephone counselling and telephone risk assessment. Um, but here in Victoria, we also have a very good risk rating scale upon which one can actually build a good evidence-based risk assessment. Uh, a number of the public sector services use very, very good clinical assessment and risk management tools. So I think it's also about adapting to whatever context you're, whatever group of people you're working with as well. So yes, I think it's really important to use an evidence-based risk assessment tool. Yeah. Okay. Useful. Thanks. Uh, so, Monica, if I could bring you in and just take this one step further. So, what do you do? Um, what can you do to, I guess, help patients feel grounded and feel um, more secure when they're very distressed and you're not there in person to provide the, the kind of the benefits of that physical presence? What, what, what would you do, Monica? Or how do we manage that mm. situation? Well, I'd love to get the other um, panellists sort of ideas as well because it's the one thing that terrified me when I started doing this, um, especially because I decided um, to jump right in and do some EMDR online with clients who'd already been um, doing the process. And, uh, and so what I use is the sound of my voice. Um, and I think that there is something about staying really calm and talking it through and saying, I'm here with you, I'm just talking this through, and then getting them to actually stamp their feet on the ground and to look around them and to name things, objects and colours, five things they can hear, five things they can see, just that very sort of simple grounding exercise. And I have found it very successful, surprisingly, and also to have a drink of water. So those are the things that I use. Good. And again, you know, I hate to sound like a broken record, but they are the kind of things that we would use in face-to-face in -face sessions in as well, session, aren't they? Yeah, those those yeah. kind of grounding tools. So we need to remember them and not think that we need something completely different and off the wall just because it's telecounselling. But um, can I just I've, – I've got to say this because this is one of the participants, you know, presenting the worst possible case scenario. What if a person expresses suicidal or self-harm, suicidal intent? Yeah hangs up, refuses to answer your calls, yes. and their music, uh, emergency contact number is uncontactable. You know, this well, kind of worst case scenario. Right. Well, so so yeah. that's why I get two emergency contact numbers and they go, oh, but I don't have a second one. I say, your neighbor, your workmate, huh? someone, okay? I need to have two. We don't proceed until we have two because we're doing counseling online. The consent form I send for them to read beforehand and, I, and then I say, have you read the consent form? We'll go through it together also says it gives them the lifeline number and the local mental health emergency number as well. So they can always refer to that. Um, and, uh, and we have a crisis plan. Like what are we going to do if things, if, if the wheels fall off, what am I going to do? Shall I call the ambulance? Shall I call you? You know, what, what's going to happen? And so we talk about what we're going to do in the case of, if they hang up and they're really distressed, I send them a text message to say, you know, the phone connection was lost, the video connection was lost, this is Lifeline, this is the mental health number, if you need to call me, I'm here. And then I assume that if they're adults that got to this stage, if they have actually expressed suicidal ideation, and I have a contract with them, that if they say they're suicidal or they're not safe, I call the ambulance. I just say, I'm going to hang up and call triple O, but I will do that in my rooms anyway. Yeah, sure, sure. Okay, <clears throat> thank you for that, Monica. Um, I want to move on to something else, but just quickly, do either of you, David or Tessa, have anything you want to add to this idea of managing distress 
uh, in these settings? Just to reinforce what you said, Monica, you know, it's a normal request of any service that you offer, you provide an emergency contact. It's the same with a mental health service. It's an expectation, it's common, it's across the board. So I totally agree with you. you that's asked for at the beginning. And, and I, I think that uh, um, uh, experiences by a lot of uh, practitioners would be that when, when there's a crisis uh, that, that the client has encountered, that a lot of the work is probably done by phone anyway. So really, it, it, with, with that in mind, um, certain things just haven't changed. It's just um, um, uh, that, that um, yeah, you know, if they have a crisis during a session, that might be different. But yeah, you know, it's pretty, I, I, I would have thought it would have been always the case that uh, a lot of crisis management is done between sessions over the phone. And I, I just add to, I think, uh, um, I don't know if, uh, if he would agree with this, but also um, having the police to provide a um, welfare check is a, another option, is that? Yeah, thank you for saying yes. that. I forgot to add that, but you know, when all else fails, it's the emergency services, all the police. Okay, thanks for that. Let's move on. Um, and I guess perhaps well, I'll stick with you, David, for the moment, but just very briefly, uh, we've had a lot of specific questions about whether a particular type of therapy can be done in telecounseling, you know, whether it's uh, mindfulness or relaxation or hypnosis or trauma-focused work or whatever, big long list. Um, and I know you specialize in CBT, but do you think that there are, well, does CBT work okay? And are there, other, are there any that you would say, no, you shouldn't be trying this form of therapy? Well, um, the, the, the link that I um, uh, supplied through this webinar is a link that uh, um, had been um, shared by my colleagues at, at Healthy Minds. So it's a very, very good um, um, information, rich uh, website by the Western Australian Government, which if you are doing um, telehealth, uh, uh, sorry, telecounselling um, CBT work, can come in handy in terms of having the handouts that I've mentioned previously um, available because you know some aspects of of CBT you know rely on um, a fair bit of information anyway. Like if you're you know talking about um, uh, activity scheduling, um, behavioural activation, this, these these sort of interventions I find have a, a, a fair bit of background information attached to that. And that's part of uh, having, a, uh, you know, building up a therapeutic alliance uh, yeah. as well. So, that, so they, they yeah. feel like they're part of it and they own the process. Um, but in terms of what can't be, uh, or you know, we the no-go areas. Monica's mentioned the MDR a, a few times. Uh, you, you know, telecounselling. Mm -hmm. So that was the one thing prior to her mentioning it that I thought um, would be the one thing that um, it would be um, a very Bit of a miracle to pull well, off. I'm, I'm, I'm glad you raised it, David, because I also picked up the fact that Monica mentioned that a couple of times. So tell us, Monica, you go all right with EMDR on, on Zoom? Okay, again, it was a thing of, of seat first. Although I did watch a, a webinar by Marjon Peters, who is a clinician from, the, from Europe who's been doing, um, it was put on by the APS. Um, she's been doing uh, EMDR for years now. Uh, all over the world and she only does it online. I also looked up some research um, and there is research to show that um, remote, you know, sort of using uh, a video conference EMDR was actually quite effective. And so because these patients I'd already worked with them, I knew them, they were fairly stable, they didn't have personality disorders, they had specific issues they wanted to continue to work with, then I said, okay, well, look, let's give it a go. And I don't use an app. I don't use um, any fancy gizmos. I just use a very bright marker that I hold in front and I'll go to the side and I'll just do my thing. Um, and it's been extremely effective. I've been really surprised. It's almost as if there is something about being in the privacy of their own home um, and sort of doing it in a sense where there isn't anything else to distract them. Uh, there is something about that's very focused and very effective. And so I've been really pleasantly surprised with it. And again, you know, we've been, we, we do it slowly and gradually. 
in little bits and use the grounding techniques. It's been it's been excellent. So yes, well, that, I have jumped in big twist. That is that is very interesting. I must say that I, yeah. I wouldn't have I wouldn't have thought it was possible, but I'm glad it is. That's good either. good news. Um, uh, Tessa, you are quite interested in group therapy. Can you run groups through? Absolutely, uh, absolutely. Um, uh, I think the individuals, it's easier um, if individuals log in separately. So using a video platform, it's actually much more difficult if, you know, the, the group as a whole is there and you're somewhere else. So, but it actually can work. Um, I, I, you need to pay much more attention. You've got to keep the process flowing. You've got to have kind of some ground rules about how everyone manages each other, all the you know, the, the normal kind of communication rules about not speaking over the top of each other. It's really important to be natural too and but also give people permission to nod, to agree, to, you know, to work off each other's cues. So um, I think that's really important. The thing about group work though is that it can be really tiring. It's much more tiring than, than working with an individual for an hour or an hour and a half. Yeah, and yeah. you use Zoom, don't you? I do, do, and, yeah. I, and I, um, I prefer Zoom to say Teams for group work because you can see everyone in Zoom on the monitor, whereas for Teams, it only goes to four people. So, yeah. Okay, very interesting. I've got to keep moving along. Um, I'm going to just throw this to you, Monica, but I know it's a bit unfair because I know none of you would consider yourself to be child experts, but we did have a whole lot of um, questions about children. And we did allude earlier to the idea of the privacy difficulties when you're t treating children at home like this. Um, but have you got any other, just very briefly, any key issues that you would want to comment on in terms of working with children? And so I think the thing about working with children is, is that um, they're easily, the younger they are, they're easily distractible. But Marjon Peters was saying she does EMDR with children as young as five. That um, being able to see their bedrooms, they can show you their toys, their games, actually helps them to engage in therapy. And she asked to have the parents there to actually keep them, you know, from wandering away. The older children, the teenagers, one of my GP colleagues actually had a teenager who's social anxiety as a presenting feature. And rather than being dragged into the rooms by her parents, she was able to have the consultation in her bedroom where she felt very safe. And because her laptop was just beside her, she was able to enrol in the This Way Up course on social anxiety and start right there, right then, which would not have happened if she'd come to the surgery. So there are some advantages in telehealth for children and teenagers. Mm, interesting point. Mm. Um, David, can I just bring you in? You did allude to this. I just want to check whether there's anything more you want to say about it. But I'm interested in the idea of assessing progress during telecounseling. You did talk about perhaps using the K10 or something a bit more regularly. Um, yeah, do, are we using different tools, do you think, or different processes to uh, assess progress during telecounseling? Um, it, uh, in, in, in the time I've, I've used it, through phone and, and, and now video, I have uh, really haven't found the, the need to um, shift my focus to other tools. Uh, uh, the, the tools, you know, um, a few of them, there being a few of them, I haven't really needed to um, change the, um, the, 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 the mix. Okay, tools but I think use. you implied that you might do it more, more often. Would that be right? It's, it's about the frequency. Yeah, 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 okay. Yeah, I, I would agree. I, can I just say, you know, I think it's important to ask how we're going with the process all the time. You know, I always finish each session that I'm running, whoever I'm working with, with how did we go? You know, how did I go? How did you find the process? And what will you take from the process? So I think there's an ongoing evaluation as well as I think it's important to formally evaluate and review. Um, using a tool like KTN. I, I think it's a very good good point, Tessa. And again, I'd say it's true for face to face. There's indeed a, a whole body of research, isn't there, about exactly that, about asking at the end of every session, how valuable was this session? Is any feedback from me or whatever? Uh, I confess that I don't do it, but I, I should, and I will. I will. I will. I promise I will. Okay, let's just move on. Finally, we've got about two minutes to go, or, or a few minutes to go. 
And just think a little bit about self-care and, and, and whether or not there are particular issues we should be considering in terms of looking after ourselves in this. And I might come to you, Tessa, I think, and just, just uh, you, you've mentioned or there's been a bit of mention of boundaries, but can you say something about boundary issues here and, and, and whether or not these are particularly important? Absolutely. Um, you know, it's, I think it's actually more important when you're using a video platform to practice good self-care. Um, uh, particularly, uh, unlike you, Monica, uh, you know, I will sometimes find myself not, not having enough of a break between sessions, whatever it is. So I think it's really important to pace your workload, um, uh, you know, extremely important. Otherwise, because it is very tiring, believe it or not, it, because you're, you're listening so hard, you're looking so hard, I think it is can be extremely hard work. So the self-care is always, always important, more so. Supervision, can't say how important supervision is, uh, extremely mm. important. Mm. But the advantage is we can do supervision online as well. So mm. that's, uh, that's good. Um, Monica or, or David, did you want to add anything to this about looking after yourself and boundaries? Just on the boundaries, I was going to just reiterate what you said earlier, Monica, about as yeah. simple as putting on your work clothes, or um, I think I think is important, and also the background that people have talked about that that maybe gives some thought to what's in the background. It's not maybe too personal, you know. It's a kind of I don't know whether you'd agree with that, but you're not. You, you, yeah, you've got to keep that boundary as well because it's in your home. That's right. And so, and it is true that people will ask, oh, you know, what have you been doing and how is it? And, um, but in the same way that I get people asking questions about my life and my family and all that kind of thing in my rooms, and I just gently say, look, we could talk about me. I'd love to talk about me, but isn't this session about you? Let's focus on you. And sometimes I get curious about why they're trying to deflect. You know, we say, gee, we keep coming back to me. What's going on? You know, help me out here. So that also helps as well, I think. Okay. Um, and look, to say that initially, I want to give hope to all you people out there. It's not that exhausting in the sense that when I first started, I was exhausting. I had Zoom fatigue to the max. But the more I've done it, the easier it's become. And I've actually had some sessions where I've had to have no breaks, uh, bad planning. And, um, and it's actually worked out okay. I actually feel a lot better now and could continue to do it. So there's hope. Okay, guys? Just letting you know. Very much so, and I'm glad that actually throughout the presentation, I hope people have picked them up, all three of you have commented on a number of positives about it, and, and that being able to work from home, it's not all bad, you know, there may be some disadvantages, but a lot of advantages too, uh, so yeah, yeah, I quite agree. Um, okay, uh, where are we going? Yeah, I was just going to pick up on that point that you made actually, Monica, that I've just got this feeling that people actually are more likely to ask me about myself on telecounseling than they are face to face. I don't know whether that other other people find that, but uh, more interested to know who is this person I'm talking to, especially if it's just telephone. Is that something others others would find? Not uh, absolutely. In my well, yeah, but uh, it, interesting. Um, having again um, that uh, the use of the telephone for a few years now, the only questions that come across. Uh, you know, what's your experience and how, often, how long have you been doing this? The standard sort of questions, but not nothing um, if you're saying, you know, uh, questions about personal, uh, my personal life. I, I haven't come across it, but but uh, Tessa, you're saying you have. Okay, could, could I just add something to that? Yeah, please do. Um, sure. Um, so using the video platform, say, for group work was quite new, newer to me around in this COVID time. And um, I noticed myself, you know, noticing other people's rooms, wherever they were working from. And, you know, being extremely curious as I am, kind of wanting to ask. And I did have to watch that, actually, so that... Um, it wasn't about my curiosity, but, you know, the purpose that I was actually facilitating that group for. So, um, but it just reminds me kind of the importance of what's the purpose of this. And it was, it was really about the newness of it. And, and you know, so sure. it is sure. important point. to pay attention to self. 
Well, OK. And so literally one minute. Any any very quick comments more about looking after yourself, about working from home? Any tips that people need to bear in mind to look after themselves? Or should we wind it there? No, no, no one's jumping in. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, go on. I, I think it is important to, to admit I have disclosed, OK, especially at the beginning when there was so much distress and there is still so much distress about what's going on overseas and you know, the, the, the public catastrophe, the private calamities, you know, the personal losses, like it's all, it's all out there. Um, it is important to say that, you know, sometimes I do cry, that, I, I, you know, yes, I have a professional face, but, you know, it, it runs deep, like we're all going through the same thing um, and that it's okay and that we don't, and people who say it's homeschooling, it is not homeschooling. It is disaster schooling. <laughs> so can we just adjust our expectations? That's the last thing I wanted to say. Uh, it's a very good point. So I think you. David's last slide that I unfortunately didn't get time to talk through in detail was exactly that about adjusting your expectations. Yeah. So good. Yes. Okay, I'm sorry, but the time has, uh, has beaten us, so we need to wind up. Can I just ask each of the panel members briefly if they've got a couple of three dot points as take-home messages that they'd like to leave the participants with. I might come to you first, Monica. Any, any final messages for our participants? So if someone appears very upset at the end of a session, one thing I have found very helpful is to ask them what they had for breakfast and to walk them through their morning. It helps to ground them in their adult self. The other thing is that um, you know people come with expectations of counselling itself, and that still needs to be addressed. So all the usual things and if you're using platform the third thing if you're using the zoom platform do share your screen and show you know documents that you want to show them go through a structured problem solving sheet or anything you've downloaded from the center for clinical interventions which is a wonderful website resources available later um those are my three tips yeah yeah yep and that's good advice isn't it about the capacity to share the screen there i think is nice um david uh, any final take-home messages from you um, I really the, the, perhaps the, that one message was about the um, uh, setting, uh, resetting expectations that uh, especially when, when starting out, the, um, so with, uh, let's assume that um, most practitioners have um, embarked on uh, telecounseling for quite a few weeks now, but um, for anyone embarking on it um, currently, to re- perhaps uh, do a bit of an expectation reset, that um, you, you will encounter some frustrations and and um, difficulties and technological meltdowns. But the you know the the um, the enjoyment is in like everything else in life, mastering mastering the uh, the, the new platform, and then you know beyond that, then uh, it may become a, a permanent feature of your work maybe in a slightly different way post-pandemic, but, uh, you know, something yeah. you, you adopt in the long term. Might change the whole way you work. It's an interesting way of leaving it there, David. And Tessa, any take-home messages from you? Absolutely. Um, first one is be organised, be planned, be prepared. You know, re- plan your hour, plan your day, plan your week. Um, uh, the other one is be kind to self. You know, if things go wrong, they will go wrong. And when they do... Manage it as best you can and, you know, be kind to yourself about it. And the third one is be real as well. Be, you know, be who you are. You know, this has taught me, particularly COVID, is um, I am who I am. I am the same person as, that I was in an office as I am I am here and perhaps a little more. And when, when you can, have some fun. <laughs> Have some fun. That's got, that's got to be a good note to finish on, isn't it? I agree. Uh, thank you uh, very much. Let me just make a few closing uh, comments here. As we said earlier, there are a whole lot of supporting resources, and you've heard our panellists allude to some of them as we've been through the webinar tonight. Uh, as I said, uh, MHPN will email you the link to those resources within a week or so, and I do urge you to take the time to have a look through them because there's some great stuff there. I would also mention, I believe the slide is coming up a bit later after I've said goodbye, but uh, I would also mention that MHPN uh, supports a whole lot of uh, practitioner networks where clinicians from different disciplines can come together and get support and share tips and resources and referrals and so on and so forth. So do check that out, particularly if you're in a relatively socially isolated uh, area, 
check them out because those networks are really, really good. Okay, uh, I'm going to ask you please to make sure that you complete the feedback survey before you log out. That means clicking the yellow button, I believe. Um, and uh, at this point, then, I'd just like to thank everybody. I'd like to thank MHPN for organizing it, Redback for doing the tech stuff, the Victorian and Tasmanian PHN Alliance for, uh, for initiating it in the first place. I'd really like to thank our three panelists, and I'm sure you would join me if you could, in thanking Monica, David, and Tessa for what I thought was a great webinar, and they've got such enormous skills uh, to share with us tonight, and I'm really grateful for that. And I'd like to thank you, all of you, our participants, for joining us tonight and for engaging and, uh, and sending in the questions and so on. You know, it really is your active involvement that makes these things go so well. So thanks very much to everybody, and good night to all. <laughs>